What's going on, everybody? So for a long time, most of us have known there was something really off about our fisheries management here in North Carolina. In 2023, we hit a new all-time high. We have two state-sponsored agencies arguing with each other over the flounder season. Let's be really clear here. This is the equivalent of getting a DUI and losing your driver's license in Raleigh and then moving to Moorhead City and the cops there being like, ah, it's fine, you can drive, man, you're good. We don't recognize the authority of those cops. But wait, there's even more. I did a previous video covering a commercial fisherman that was caught setting nets in protected inland waters. And even though he's had charges for this particular offense ranging back into the 1990s, the commercial license that he was operating under in this time would have never taken a hit. So this loophole allows commercial fishermen to commit this offense an infinite number of times and never actually lose their commercial license because DMF doesn't recognize the authority of wildlife. Wait, why do we have two state agencies in the first place? Nobody else does this. Why is the DMF telling us one thing and everybody that's on the water seeing something totally different? And it doesn't take a genius to figure out there's something fishy going on here. Hi, my name's Steve Brewster, and this is my favorite place in the whole world. I run a YouTube channel called Fishing with Brewski. I'm a volunteer in the North Carolina tagging program. And my family's number one idea of a weekend getaway is staying on the Pamlico River. All right, so if you don't know how the machine works, You'll never realize why it's broken, so we got to talk about this. Our fisheries management in North Carolina. At the top of the food chain, we have the North Carolina General Assembly. This is made up of senators and state representatives, and they can make laws. They can push forward bills that can eventually become law. If those bills become law, it sits above the DMF. It sits above the Marine Fisheries Commission. It's a law. It's above everyone. In the normal process, however, Governor Roy Cooper appoints all seats to the Marine Fisheries Commission. So the commercial seats, we have three. Recreational seats, we have three. At large, which means like the general public, we have two. And scientists have one. Please remember, Governor Roy Cooper appoints all these seats. And it is the people in those seats that have the actual rulemaking authority. In the normal process for management, they do what's called an FMP, a fisheries management plan for each species. Throughout this process, the Department of Marine Fisheries, these are biologists, scientists, they make recommendations to the Marine Fisheries Commission based off the science. What I'm about to show you is going to upset a lot of people. These people have a very particular method of attack that I've recognized over time. I don't want to talk about myself, but it's necessary to dispel some of the ways that they may try to misguide you away from the truth. I am by no means rich, and I have never had anything given to me in this world. I joined the Marine Corps when I was 19 years old, and I have earned everything that I have since then. I do not hate commercial fishermen in any way. In fact, I only decided to make this video after speaking to a commercial fisherman of more than 50 years and realizing that this fight has not been recreational versus commercial. This fight for decades has been rich, influential people and everyone else. Just like most of our government systems, First, a quick overview of the history from 1994 up until 2013. From 1994 to 2003, commercial landings for southern flounder averaged 3.6 million pounds. During this period, recreational landings accounted for only 13% of the total landings to the state. The size limit from 1993 to 2001 was 13 inches, and a recreational fisherman had no bag limit. In 2006, at the Southern Flounder FMP, 
The DMF identified a total reduction needed of 17.2% to restore southern flounder stocks. To make this happen, the Marine Fisheries Commission voted on a 30.5% cut to the recreational fishery and a 15% cut to the commercial fishery. Fast forward to 2013, the science does not look good, the cuts are not working. No further action is taken by the Marine Fisheries Commission against the commercial fishery, but the recreational size limit is raised to 15 inches. For some reason, the cuts aren't working. This is the commercial landings for southern flounder during the same time period we just discussed. There's effectively no change from 2006 to 2013. What I'm about to show you was the first attempt of the Marine Fisheries Commission when southern flounder were in so much trouble by this time that they were going to be forced to actually make cuts to the commercial industry. This is a clip from the WRAL documentary, Net Effect. I highly recommend you all watch it at length. August 2015, the Marine Fisheries Commission meets to vote on new flounder restrictions. I think we're going to start with you, Catherine. It was a sentiment repeated at a public hearing in August when the commission met to vote on the restrictions. The fish stocks have gotten smaller and now everyone is left fighting over the crumbs. We need some drastic measures to correct some drastic mistakes. But commercial fishermen said they would be unfairly punished by new restrictions. My belief that recreational fishing is killing more fish than it's keeping through dead discards. We ask the commission to not make this mistake in management on Southern Flounder. Commercial fishermen also complained that the commission did not have the legal authority to impose the restrictions. They said that would instead require the much longer process of amending the state's fisheries management plan. They got 13 coastal legislators to sign a letter to the secretary of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources saying as much. The letter was delivered on the eve of the commission's vote on the gillnet restrictions at its August meeting. And the letter's message was delivered the same day in person at the commission's meeting by one of the legislators who signed it. I am not here to offer you any advice as to how you might want to cast your vote, but I can share with you this, that there are a significant number of legislators who are going to be watching this vote very, very carefully. If any decision that's made is not interpreted as being fair, you will likely be dealing with the legislature moving forward. So, uh, you know, not a threat, it's just, uh, it's a fact. If we're not supposed to take this as a threat, how are we supposed to take this? I'm not taking the side, as some would suggest, of the, uh, of the commercial fishermen. I'm taking the side of fairness, wherever that is. Steinberg's critics say fairness would be considering the public comment gathered by the Marine Fisheries Commission over several months, which was overwhelmingly in favor of stricter gill net restrictions, including a ban. And the commission's attorney said it had the legal authority to impose them. You're gonna run into a buzzsaw. But those 13 legislators a Deaner attorney and even the director of the State Division of Marine Fisheries say the commission does not. The secretary. It's very important to note here that Dr. Lewis Daniel, at the time the director of the Department of Marine Fisheries, is not saying that this will not help solve the issue. He is stating that the commission does not have the legal authority to make these changes without amending the FMP process, which takes forever. The process changes conveniently. The commission postponed its vote on the gillnet restrictions. <laughs> well, there you have it. They won. And it's important to note at this point that even for me, I was touched by some of the commercial fishermen that spoke, and I told myself that there must be something I just don't understand about this. As unfair as it seems, it was events that happened much later that changed my mind about this and made me look further into it. We're going to go back and we're going to take a look at that letter that got sent to the Marine Fisheries Commission. The letter that changed it all and prevented any meaningful management to be done at the time, which has led us to effectively a closed non-existent season now. Now, when you look up these names individually and you look at all their contributions, you just go down, figure out who's pulling their strings. You don't have to look for long before you start to see another name that we just saw popping up over and over and over again.
Hold up. You might be telling yourself this guy's a business owner and a strong supporter of the Republican Party. This isn't unusual at all. We're not quite done yet. I'm taking the side of fairness. 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 It's important to note that the contributions that I've shown here are barely scratching the surface, with Brent Fulcher alone contributing more than seventy-five thousand dollars since two thousand eight. This is Brent Fulcher. Brent Fulcher is the chairman of the North Carolina Fisheries Association. He's also the owner of a fleet of trawls and two seafood houses. So you might ask, what is the North Carolina Fisheries Association? It is publicly listed as a lobbying group. The disgusting thing about this is that it is actually a state-funded lobbying group. Now, it's not exactly as simple as that. I'll have to show you a piece of legislation so that you can understand where this thing comes from. This is the piece of legislation that created the Commercial Fishing Resource Fund. So the Commercial Fishing Resource Fund was created when they increased the costs of commercial licenses to cover the ITP. The ITP is a whole other subject I'll probably talk about in a later video, but basically it gives you permission to kill endangered species. In order to do this, you have to pay observers to go out and observe so many net sets to see how badly the turtles are affected. So, you can see the amounts that they cover here. Uh, $200 from standard commercial fishing license, $100 from retired. They're taking money from each license. And in here, it expressly states, after the priority set forth in Subdivision 1, that's, that's the ITP, right? See this Federal Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Federal Endangered Species Act? That's the ITP that they're talking about covering. This is part two. After the priority set forth in subdivision one of this section has been fully funded, the fund may be used for other projects to develop and support sustainable commercial fishing in the state. And this little piece of uh, evidence is the budget report from the Commercial Fishing Resource Fund. I'm going to bring your attention to the public relations campaign right here. $416,000. So what are they talking about when they say public relations campaign? Here we go. So this is part of it. There's also a social media campaign. There's a billboard campaign. These are some of the receipts from the billboards. Social media content plan. NC Catch will take a series of steps to ensure accurate real-time information is provided via major social media channels. Now if we look a little deeper into this, we can find some of their billing here. Ah, here we go. So these are some of the things they're going to be doing. Social media posting and engaging. Every single month, there are people being paid by a government-funded lobbying organization to educate you on social media. You ever say something negative about commercial fishing on social media and notice that you get a response in about three seconds? Yeah, me too. The simple existence of this fund is a little bit upsetting. I buy a recreational fishing license and yet I have no say over what happens to this. My money goes and funds the DMF. It's not just that this fund exists, that they're showing how much control they have over our legislature. It's that they're pushing this idea of foreign seafood being so dangerous for you, which is actually, in some cases, is true. Uh, any kind of farm-raised fish is pretty toxic stuff. Most people know that now. The issue is when we see this. The problem is that again and again and again, we have seafood processors, seafood owners, seafood distributors, and studies showing that this local seafood that you're paying a premium price for is in fact not local seafood. So do these seafood dealers, does the NCFA care if you're getting fresh, healthy local seafood, or are they just business owners wanting you to buy their seafood? And the worst part about this whole situation is that while they're buying this foreign crab meat at such low prices, they're going to be telling local crabbers not to go out because they can't compete with foreign prices, all the while selling millions of dollars of imported crab, imported shrimp, imported fish, you name it. If it comes from the ocean, they're importing it, they're mislabeling it, and they're selling it to you. And they're using a state-funded propaganda campaign to help them do it. 
but surely they at least care about the environment, right? I mean, what would they do if they destroyed the place where they make their living from? Unfortunately, we're not done yet on that point either. All right, let's see how our fish house owners feel about the environment. So this covers a couple of issues that actually happened in, in 2023, or the fine was issued in 2023 anyway. So this is Chris Fulcher, owner of Point Pride Seafood, and they were caught blasting and scraping paint off of their boat into the local waterway. And the article says, Oriental Police Officer Nick Blaney was informed who contacted Point Pride Seafood owner Chris Fulcher mid-morning Saturday. Officer Blaney told Town Doc that Fulcher stated it would cease and they would clean up the harbor. No effort to clean the harbor was observed. In fact, the opposite occurred. Crew was spotted later that day continuing the work. So this happens again on March 2nd. Fishing trawler Gaston Bell, another Fulcher-owned fishing vessel, was anchored in the middle of the Noose River. Crew were seen in hazmat suits, grinding paint on the pilot house. A passing boater notified Sound Rivers, who notified DEQ. That's the Department of Environmental Quality. The DMF fall under them. A fine of $21,588 was issued on February 7th, 2023 for both violations. The second violation appears to be willful given that Fulcher Seafood Inc. has been notified about the first violation, yet they still conducted another in-water boat maintenance with only the location changed. And why would he do this? Well, it's pretty simple why he did it. He's a businessman. It was cheaper to do his boat maintenance on the water than it was to pull it out, have it properly cleaned, and deal with all the downtime. This way, he can have that trawl run it again as soon as possible. Now to be very clear here, even after I discovered this, I just refuse to believe in conspiracy. Truly believe that people are good at their core. And I always try to find that in people. I attempted to contact the Fulchers. I left messages, I called. They refused to speak to me. I attempted to contact all of the legislators involved in this. I called their offices. I left messages. I sent them emails. I sent them polite emails, just asking for information. I just wanted to understand what was really going on here. I, I was sure that I was just misunderstanding this, that it wasn't what it looked like. After they all refused to speak to me, I did the next best thing. I spoke to every single person I could find who had knowledge of the history of our fisheries in this state. I spoke to every commercial fisherman that would talk to me. And in the end, one in particular stood out. A commercial fisherman of more than 50 years. I won't mention his name here because he's already received death threats. But he was telling me about when he was fighting against the trolls 40 years ago. And behind closed doors, the director of the DMF told him, I would love to get rid of these, but if I tried to, they would throw me out. The governor would just replace me. I was absolutely floored when he told me this, but it all became very clear. And that's when I decided I was gonna make this video. I was gonna continue the fight. I was gonna pick up the fight of a commercial fisherman. Do not get this twisted at all. This has never, never been about recreational versus commercial. The commercial man has suffered far more than anyone. These vast empires of these wealthy families have been built on the backs of commercial fishermen. In 1915, Atlantic sturgeon was in the top five commercially harvested fish in North Carolina waters. How many of you have ever seen an Atlantic sturgeon? I've seen one in all the time that I've been fishing, and I didn't even see it personally. I saw a photo of it that came from someone else. River herring, same thing, 1915. It's in the top harvests. These fish are, they're gone. They're gone. There are so few of these fish left. Gray trout. You can find many people who have fished around North Carolina for a while in the 80s who will tell you they filled 100 quart coolers on a daily basis. This was a very normal thing. And then very suddenly they just vanished. It just so happens this was around the same time when the large scale trawls really started hitting the sounds. Let's take a look at a little trawl bycatch. This is in North Carolina. And these are outfitted with the fish excluder devices that they tell you work so well. I can barely even make out a shrimp in any of that. I see a lot of crabs. I see a ton of fish. 
Speaking of gray trout, gray trout, spot, and croaker are the three primary fish, the fish hit the hardest by the trolls. But they're not alone in that. If you pay attention here, we're going to see plenty of southern flounder coming up too. And these are just the couple we can see on the top of the pile. Not a single one of these southern flounder is counted towards the commercial quota each year that have just been left there to die. There's croakers, there's spot, there's gray trout everywhere, by the millions, really. It's, this is how they function. In fact, it's not by the millions. It's a billion juvenile fish every year. That's the estimate. This comes straight from Dr. Lewis Daniel, the former director of the Department of Marine Fisheries. And this wouldn't even be a particularly bad run for the southern flounder. If you know how southern flounder behave, you'll know that they congregate in large groups. The impact of a trawl on these grouped up flounder would be absolutely devastating. Not a single fish that comes on this deck survives, period. And not a single one is counted towards the commercial quota each year. The value of the spot, croaker, and weak fish that are killed in these nets would be worth a fortune to the regular everyday hard-working commercial fishermen that don't have a half a million dollar trawl to run. People will try to tell you that we have a good management system, that it's working well. Mexico has banned inshore shrimp trawling since 2015 and it is still legal in North Carolina. So we gotta do a little math here. A billion fish a year. The commercial fishery likes to talk about how they don't trawl two thirds of the Pamlico Sound. If we included the Albemarle Pamlico Sound region, we have about 3,000 square miles of open water. If we remove two-thirds of that, we have 1,000 square miles of open water left. If a billion fish are killed annually across 1,000 square miles, this means for every square mile, a million juvenile fin fish are killed every single year. Well, there you have it, folks. I can't lay it out any plainer than that. Why do we have two separate state agencies running things? Because the cartel that controls our fisheries management, that controls our government, doesn't want to have one agency. Because they do not have sway over the Wildlife Resources Commission. This is not surprising. This is not unusual. Anywhere in this world where there's a fortune to be made, there are people willing to do absolutely anything to make it. To absolutely stomp on anyone. And in this case... They've stomped on their fellow commercial fishermen the worst. And they've tricked them into thinking that their numbers have dwindled so much due to regulation rather than overfishing causing regulation to be absolutely necessary. I didn't even mention striped bass, which were fished right to the point of extinction. If you're catching striped bass in the Noose River, those are stocked fish. Yeah, the Wildlife Resources Commission put those fish there. There is no more spawning stock in the Noose River. In the Pamlico River, it's down to around 40%. 60% of those fish are stocked. In the Cape Fear River, if you're catching striped bass, those are stocked fish. These fish were fished in a trawl fishery as recently as, I think, 2018. I can't even remember off the top of my head. Very recent. They trawl fished. Oh, yeah, the trawls catch big fish. Don't, don't let anyone fool you with this. They can absolutely catch big fish with these trawls. In fact, in the ocean fisheries around the rest of the world, this is the most common way they're used. So this is what it is. No surprise. There's a fortune to be made, and people were willing to go out there and take it. They've run incredible media campaigns, and they've influenced the North Carolina public for decades. So whose fault really is it? Well, up until this point, you could blame these individuals. This small group of very wealthy people that have mined a fortune from the waters of North Carolina and used that fortune to manipulate our management, to manipulate our government, so they could continue to build this wealth. Now that I know these things, now that you know these things, if it continues, it is not their fault. It is our fault. This whole game is a house of cards. It's all about deception, disruption, deflection, and delay. But it takes more than knowing the truth. I cannot do this alone. And in the past, like when the commercial fisherman that motivated me to make this video was trying to fight against them, there was absolutely no hope. But for the first time in the history of our fisheries, we actually stand a chance. The CCA has a lawsuit pending right now in the state. 
Whatever you think you know about the CCA, you should tune into some of my later videos. The CCA has been on the front lines fighting for recreational fishing, fighting for recreational fishermen, fighting to protect the resource to make it actually sustainable. They've been fighting since they had to meet in secret. You can't imagine the guts it must have taken for the first CCA members to go into those Marine Fisheries Commission meetings. Now don't get me wrong, there's some great people at the DMF. Lucas Pensinger, you've been so awesome, man. I am terribly sorry if this affects you in some negative way. But there is absolutely no question that the Department of Marine Fisheries and the Marine Fisheries Commission needs to be ripped out root and stem. And the only possibility of this happening, the only hope of this happening, is through the CCA lawsuit. So you can keep complaining on Facebook, you can get into fights with the commercial entities that are there, paid to disrupt you, to deflect you, to distract you, to spread misinformation, or you can do something about it. You can stop talking and you can join the CCA. You can support the lawsuit. You can email your representatives. I have a number of ideas. It is not easy to take down a cartel. These people are deeply embedded in our government system. But there is hope. There is hope for the first time. You know, being around here, recreational fishing in North Carolina for as long as I have, you run into all the old timers. The old timers love to talk about the good old days, and the story's always the same. It was always good and plenty. Tons of fish everywhere. I absolutely refuse to tell my children about when there used to be fish. So if you don't want to tell your children about how it used to be, if you don't want to tell the young men and women growing up in our fisheries about how it used to be great and you didn't do anything, then it's time to take some action. I've dedicated months of my life, every waking moment. I'm, I think my wife is at the end of her rope completely with me. And if you're not ready to do anything, then I'm not going to make any more videos. I'll stop and I'll drop the whole thing. But I've got about half a dozen more absolute nuclear bombs to drop on our fisheries management system and what's really going on in this state. If you want to hear about those things, let me know. Help people get informed. Help other people get informed. We even need more than just the coastal fishermen. I need the guys from Asheville that come down once a year. You can do your part. You can help us send an email. You can spread the word. You can let people know what's happening here. We are the first generation to know with absolute certainty that this is happening. And we're very likely the last to have an opportunity to do anything to stop it. If you choose to write our representatives, there's no need to be nasty. We need them on our side. We need their help. That's what they need to know, that we need their help and that our vote depends on them helping us.